the program uh, in your hands. Um,
Um, he's a material scientist by training, and actually, like, like, like many of us, uh, he uh, was in the semiconductor area and then moved to the bio nano area over the years. He worked at uh, Motorola and helped them build a large microfluidics program in the middle or late 90s. Um, and then uh, he also worked at the um, DOE Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies at the Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, he co chaired the, the Trans NIH Nanotechnology Task Force, which is coordinating the nanotechnology efforts across 27 institutes with a budget of over 300 million. Uh, he received his PhD in material science from the University of California. Uh, he's a scholar and published uh, well over 50 papers, many book chapters, and many, many conferences. So we're really glad to have him here on hand. Well, thank you, Rashid, and your fund and what is it? Oh, okay. And others for invitation. We have to switch computers, so I'll talk for a while. That was quicker than I thought. Okay. Uh, so as Rashid said, I many years ago I was doing uh, working in semiconductors and uh, and uh, gradually moved to <coughs> microfluidic devices and eventually to uh, nanotechnology in cancer. So it's always interesting for me to talk in front of the engineering audience because uh, I feel that uh, my learning as well as probably yours from the biological standpoint is in progress, but every day of this learning brings uh, new possibilities of how we can uh, uh, use nanotechnology or technology in general in relevant medical applications. So that slide to people who are oncologists or work in cancer biology is well known, but, uh, but uh, to people who come uh, uh, to this work from technology angle uh, is probably not that known, but it's really compelling and that shows why this work is so relevant. Uh, <clears throat> every year, uh, over 500,000 million America, 500, Americans die of cancer. Uh, and about one and a half million uh, Americans are diagnosed with cancer. Uh, so that, uh, considering large but not incredibly large population of this country, is really, uh, is really creating a major emotional burden uh, on the society. And also it creates uh, a very strong uh, fiscal burden on the healthcare system. The cost of, uh, uh, of uh, cancer to, to our nation is about $200 billion a year. Now, another important thing is if you look at the progress <coughs> which we are making in terms of uh, reducing mortality from cancer as compared to other diseases, we're definitely making this progress, however, this progress is not as compelling as we would like it to be. Uh, if you look at the mortality rates from cardiovascular diseases, they dropped uh, almost three times in the last 50 years. Uh, when it comes to cancer, uh, they dropped slightly, but not, uh, you, you see it here, but not of course, to that rate. Now, this is probably more complex than other diseases from the perspective of uh, people getting older, I mean, people living longer, and as a result, uh, more people getting cancer, and also more people surviving with cancer, living with it uh, for a long period of time. Nevertheless, it's, we're still fairly far from converting into a chronic disease where you can live with it for, for, for life, essentially, and, and manage it. And of course, uh, this uh, problem is compounded across the world. Uh, about uh, seven and a half million people died from cancer in uh, uh, 2005. And again, uh, now when uh, many countries in the world are developing aggressively forward, uh, life expectancy there is uh, increasing. And again, uh, many of them will have uh, increasing problems with cancer. And uh, that again has, uh, is not only from from the aspect of, of uh, simply human cost, but also from the uh, cost uh, to the to the healthcare system, and you see it you see it here. It's about one trillion dollars uh, dedicated to uh, treating and managing uh, patients with cancer uh, around the world. So it's clear that in addition to the contemporary methods which we already have in both diagnosis and therapy, we need some more and better uh, techniques which can, which can manage the disease. Uh, and nanotechnology, as, as you heard from Rashid, is essentially about <coughs> utilizing and leveraging novel materials properties 
to number of different applications. And of course, the applications which I will talk about uh, are related to oncology. So we think that uh, these new material properties can be used essentially in three uh, or uh, two large or three subset categories. One of them is developing new uh, assays for early diagnosis in in vitro environment. And uh, you can leverage a lot of uh, nanosensor work to that space. Uh, and the other one is uh, working with nanoparticles of different sorts for uh, uh, towards uh, developing new contrast agents uh, for, again, uh, diagnostic techniques uh, and uh, towards delivering uh, therapies in local manner, which should and is uh, decreasing side effects while increasing the effectiveness of the therapy. And of course, uh, with that uh, comes more fundamental aspect of developing new tools which will allow to understand the disease better and by that means maybe prevent it in the future. Um, so when we thought about that uh, at NCI several years ago, uh, we concluded two things. One was that uh, this is certainly work which has to be multidisciplinary. And like a lot of centers which you have here at the university, uh, we decided to pull together people from engineering, material science, and chemistry, and match them with oncologists and cancer biologists to really have a combination of talents uh, allowing to develop new technologies, but also allowing to describe future applications and tune the use of technology to these future applications. And we started uh, the program called uh, Alliance for Nanotechnology in Cancer, uh, which uh, has a number of large uh, centers of excellence, and in addition to that has uh, training centers and uh, one uh, uh, which is uh, here is uh, one of the examples uh, and it also has uh, a smaller um, so-called platform awards. But if you look at the uh, out output of this program in the last uh, seven years now, uh, it has been really pretty outstanding. And uh, that doesn't apply only to number of publications, uh, but also to strong uh, entrepreneurial and translational efforts which resulted in over 10 clinical trials which are associated with techniques which have been developed uh, in this center. So if you look at where to place this program from the perspective of uh, applications, we saw that it would be wise, especially in the second phase which started two years ago, uh, to focus on uh, two more indications which have uh, low survival rates. And that's why we encourage people to work in the space of ovarian, pancreatic, brain, and lung cancers, which, uh, as you will see at uh, future slides, uh, will have, have fairly low survival rates. Uh, fortunately, do not occur at very high frequency, except maybe lung cancer, which uh, unfortunately is, uh, is quite common. Uh, but they are not as frequent as prostate or breast. So from the programmatic standpoint, uh, as I mentioned, we have a number of centers of excellence, and there is nine of them uh, across the country. Uh, and there is a number of uh, different flavors of awards, which are color-coded here at the bottom. And training centers are one of them. And you have uh, one here uh, in, uh, in Illinois. <coughs> We try to con uh, provide opportunities for people who work in nanotechnology and cancer together. Uh, we organized first uh, Cancer Nanotechnology Garden Conference, uh, which took place uh, last year in, uh, uh, in Maine, uh, and uh, brought, as you see here, uh, over 150 people. And we'll have another one uh, next year, and I hope that some of you will be able to attend that. Jim Baker from the University of Michigan will, will be chairing the meeting. So yeah, I just uh, made this slide to show my uh, convoluted history of how it uh, got me to uh, work with oncologists, but uh, uh, I started uh, working on semiconductor materials and MOCVD, uh, which is far from oncology, but that was many years ago, and uh, we had a very good discussion about uh, some common friends uh, at dinner yesterday. Uh, but then, uh, uh, through microfluidics and what I have done at uh, Motorola and Los Alamos, I eventually arrived at uh, at uh, what uh, I'm looking at now. So I think uh, 
having this background, which really spans over a few different uh, disciplines, helped me hopefully to interact with uh, people like yourself who, who are again coming uh, from different walks of life, but uh, ultimately want to work in medical applications of the, of the technology. So, what is attractive about uh, in nanoparticles from the standpoint of, of using them in, in cancer applications, uh, in addition to number of uh, different properties which allow them to circulate in the bloodstream for an extended period of time and by this means uh, uh, accumulate at the tumor site uh, at higher rates and, and by this means allowing to deliver uh, therapies uh, more effectively um, to the tumor. Uh, what is important is the multifunctionality. They can, uh, if you design them cleverly, you can design them in such a way that they will perform a number of different functions uh, and in addition to, for instance, the, the carrying chemotherapy with cargo, they also can, uh, can be designed in such a way that uh, they can act as a, uh, uh, as a imaging uh, um, moiety and they can also be targeted uh, to the particular epitopes uh, on the cell. So again, they can be used in number of different, by kind of number of different functions, they can, in a way, hone uh, on uh, particular properties of cancer cell uh, more effectively. Uh, this is the slide which I mentioned earlier, uh, which shows five-year survival rate for a number of different um, uh, tumor indications. And as you see, uh, brain, ovarian, lung, and pancreas are unfortunately at the lower uh, end of uh, the spectrum. So, you know, it is amplifying what, what I had said earlier, uh, but the important applications here are uh, new diagnostic uh, high multiplex tools, which allow you to uh, recognize biomarkers at, uh, with high sensitivity and high specificity, and hopefully allow you to work uh, with directly with bodily fluids such that uh, sophisticated sample preparation is not required. Uh, from the uh, standpoint of delivering new therapies, uh, we hope that uh, in addition to delivering existing uh, small molecule drugs which have been already approved by FDA, we eventually will start developing new drugs based on nonpartic delivery. Uh, there's an important uh, avenue of application here uh, related to genetic uh, therapies and delivery of SRNA. And, uh, the multifunctionality of the particles, which I mentioned, uh, can be leveraged into so-called diagnostic applications, where uh, particles can serve as a diagnostic tool, mostly through so, so imaging, and then eventually uh, also deliver the therapy, uh, depending on uh, diagnosis, uh, which would the other component perform. So of course, there is number of different centers or activities which now match nanotechnology with applications in different spaces and uh, probably uh, applications in materials and uh, using them in uh, uh, different uh, sorts of or matching them with different sorts of uh, products was uh, first and then now people are uh, getting into medical applications there of course uh, take longer to come to the market because of the uh, because of their being used in humans and because, they, and because of that, they have to go through the approval process of uh, regulatory agents, agencies. I pulled this slide uh, out from the initial talk which uh, Rashid gave at uh, in the test of two years ago, but that gives uh, you a very nice summary of how many and how diversified the efforts at uh, Urbana Champaign are um, in, in that space. So what I will do next is I will break uh, topical discussions and I will show you only snapshots of work which comes from different labs, uh, but I will uh, organize it by applications to uh, in vitro diagnostic assays, uh, imaging applications, and then therapeutic aspects. And at the end, I will talk about the translation aspect and how many of these things and why and how they are moving forward into clinical trials and actually some of them uh, to the approval. So this slide shows you uh, 
uh, a compelling argument why recognition of the, of the disease at the early stage is important. 90% of uh, cancer patients die of metastatic disease, meaning of the tumor which is not at the primary site, but at the site uh, to which tumor spread. So ideally, if you would like to, if you recognize the disease at the early stage, when it's still confined to the primary tumor, in many cases, if you do the surgery, you probably can cure the patient. Unfortunately, there is not that many uh, specific enough tests which are used in broad screening to, to allow for that. And again, you can look at this graph here, which shows how uh, mortality increases depending on the stage of the, of, of the disease. And here, uh, particularly for breast cancer, uh, depending at which stage of the disease you will recognize it, uh, the survival rate will also dramatically change. So it's just essentially right now, uh, if you look at the broad population, there are only four tests which are being applied, which are recommended to be used by everybody, which is uh, uh, mammography for breast cancer, PSA testing for prostate cancer, uh, pap smear for cervical cancer, uh, and colonoscopy for colon cancer. Uh, the, the very deadly uh, types of uh, tumors like ovarian or, or pancreatic, for instance, do not really have well-established uh, uh, screening methodologies and usually, unfortunately, are recognized pretty late. So what people are trying to do is to do two things. One is to recognize biomarkers which are specific enough to recognize the disease at the early stage. And usually that's a panel uh, of markers rather than one individual one. And unfortunately these uh, panels are also developing not as fast as we would like. Uh, and the other one is to build devices or structures which now can recognize <coughs> these uh, biomarkers in a multiplex manner, meaning they, you can look at a number of different signatures at the same time. Uh, and also uh, do it with uh, high uh, specificity and high sensitivity. Uh, so I have a few examples here, uh, and I'm sure there is uh, many more uh, out there. This is uh, coming from uh, a lab of Jim Heath at Caltech. What he has done, he combined uh, microfluidics for the sample management uh, and building actual devices to uh, <clears throat> sandwich assays, which allow uh, to look at the panels of proteins uh, in these microfluidic structures. Uh, and uh, again, advantage here is if he, can, he can do it very quickly. He can do it also at very uh, low cost. Uh, and uh, he builds these structures using the so-called DNA encoded antibody libraries or DIL. Uh, so they are built in such a way that initially he is. Uh, uh, mounting the single strand DNA uh, on the surface of, uh, uh, of the bottom of the chip and then uh, by uh, attaching first antibody uh, uh, eventually builds to the uh, sandwich uh, assay. The reason to use DNA here is that uh, uh, DNA can withstand higher temperatures so they can, uh, they can withstand fabrication of the device and then flow the antibodies through the structure and then they uh, attached to the, uh, the single strand DNA anchor, which is already present, uh, present in the channel. Uh, and uh, now he's taking these devices even farther uh, to single cell applications when you don't need to utilize the uh, sample prior to introducing it to the device, but you place uh, single cells, individual cells, or very small, small sets of cells on the chambers and uh, you look uh, at the secreted proteins from the cells using the uh, sensor structures that we just uh, described. Uh, the other example, and that uh, that concept has been around for, for a while, is so-called biobarcode uh, concept, which comes from Chad Merkin, Chad Merkin's lab in Northwest and the north from, uh, from here. And essentially, the claim to fame here was to increase the sensitivity of the assay significantly by uh, using single-stranded DNA attached to the uh, magnetic beads which are participating in the binding event and that can be used both for hybridization and uh, uh, protein assays as well. Uh, so he moved the sensitivity about four orders of magnitude as compared to existing ELISA assays. And he's pursuing this work further, uh, looking now at the different modality uh, of the concept he uh, came up uh, two or three years ago with the idea called nanoflares, 
possibility of the uh, <coughs> nanoparticle of the fluorescence is quenched, but now when uh, these particles are being uptaken by the cell and uh, the fragment which carries the fluorescent dye binds to uh, <coughs> entity of interest uh, intracellularly and there can be uh, mRNA in this case, uh, the conformity of the <coughs> Uh, of the uh, uh, fragment which carries fluorescent dye changes, and as a result, you you, you get a fluorescent signal. So, so it basically is a specific, it's a specific and uh, also sensitive sensor, uh, and uh, can be used for uh, detection of uh, different intracellular entities, and also can be used for uh, therapeutic delivery. So that uh, uh, that. Uh, concept of nanoflares and SA, SNA, which are spherical nucleic gases in general, uh, is now uh, uh, taking larger space of, of the work in, in their lab. And again, the number of modalities which you can use, in which, which can build this sensor around is, is very high. You can use optical detection, you can use magnetic detection, and uh, uh, Lloyd Whitman, who will be talking later today, spent uh, a uh, big part of his life at NRL working on magnetic sensors uh, for similar applications. Uh, Ralph Weisleiter at Harvard uh, helped, helped build a sensor which is using uh, a very small NMR or nuclear magnetic resonance uh, sensors to detect uh, <coughs> aggregating cells of interest which uh, are carrying, uh, which are uh, binding to uh, iron oxide nanoparticles and then build these aggregates uh, because of that and uh, uh, transfer, transfer relaxation uh, time changes and because of that uh, NMR signal changes. Uh, and again, he has been working with panel of proteins uh, for uh, identifying different uh, tumors uh, in, in that modality and we see here a number of different versions uh, of the sensors he went through and you have uh, sensitivity uh, related to each of these uh, version and generation uh, here and it's uh, increasing uh, as, as it's shown. I put one paper from a uh, work here and, uh, and Rashid's uh, uh, work two years ago where he is building also sensors which are very sensitive to uh, identify <coughs> uh, cellular mass which uh, lands on the sensor and you can see that you can measure the changes uh, which are in uh, single digit and uh, nanograms. So now if you look uh, at different uh, imaging and therapeutic applications, uh, you can essentially break it again a number of different uh, modalities. Uh, and uh, even take it farther in breaking it down uh, on in terms of what you are trying to deliver and how you are trying to deliver the therapy. So the first early demonstrations were about taking the nanoparticle and combining it with existing small molecule, small molecule or drug and delivering it to the tumor and comparing side by side uh, a focusing of a free drug versus the drug that is carried on, on the nanoparticle. And of course, you can now, you can also, uh, as it was done in this case, uh, attach uh, uh, fluorescent moiety to track the particles um, in the system uh, um, and, and attach uh, target moiety. Now, that kind of work has been now carried out by a number of different people uh, delivering a uh, number of different uh, drugs, and uh, many of those are in clinical trials. Now the other possibility is not to deliver uh, any, any drug, but design a part in such a way that you can deliver it to the tumor site, and then using external trigger, you change the properties of the particles, in this particular case, the temperature, and by increasing the temperature of the particle, you can locally eradicate uh, tumor cells. Uh, and that's... Uh, uh, that's so-called uh, localized hyperthermia, and uh, again, that's being pursued uh, by a number of groups using different modalities. Uh, uh, Jennifer West and Naomi Hall as a drive, uh, 
built uh, nano shells which uh, are capable of uh, um, absorbing light, and by this means, uh, increasing the temperature, you can also use ionoxide particles and couple are heating uh, to them externally and uh, achieve similar, uh, similar effect. And you can also design uh, the combination of nanoparticles and drug in such a way that you create a pro-drug, meaning that drug is not active when it is in circulation, but gets activated only when it gets to the tumor site, so again, that reduces uh, uh, toxicity. Uh, and uh, delivering sRNA using uh, different types of nanoparticles, and that's important because sRNA is very fragile and deteriorates in contact with blood, so it's essentially impossible to deliver <coughs> So there's a long list of what particles can actually do uh, to make the delivery better. Uh, and I, I said the, some of these things before, but essentially the main thing is uh, that if you design them right uh, and uh, you can build them in such a way that uh, the circulation times in the bloodstream in, uh, after systemic injection are long enough to several or maybe even 20 hours, you can, uh, uh, you can alter uh, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, or PK and PD, uh, of, uh, of the drug which is carried on the particle, uh, provide higher residence in, in the serum, and as such, uh, higher accumulation of the drug with nanoparticle uh, at the tumor site. Also, you can uh, stimulate uptake of these particles into the uh, cell. Uh, so if uh, your mode of action requires intracellular activity, uh, that can be also uh, uh, very useful. And you can target them, which can, again, in increase the accumulation and increase the uh, uptake. So the phenomenon which is responsive for uptake, uh, and this is good, it is responsible for the uptake uh, or for, for the release of the particles from the tumor, uh, from the uh, bloodstream and accumulation at the tumor site is uh, uh, EPR effect or <coughs> enhanced permeability and retention effect and what it is is essentially uh, porous vascularity in the uh, proximity of the tumor. When tumor develops pretty quickly, in order to provide nutrients to it, you have to uh, uh, deliver blood uh, and uh, create vascularity around the growing tumor. And because of the quick growth, this vascularity is usually porous, uh, not as perfectly built as in other parts of the organism. And as such, if you have particles which are circulating in the bloodstream for a long time, they have high probability to escape from vascularity in uh, the proximity of the tumor. Uh, so that doesn't even require any uh, active targeting, we call it passive targeting, uh, because just by the combination of EPR and appropriate size of the particle, uh, you can allow for the particle to, uh, to uh, calm uh, the tumor. And here you see different types <coughs> of uh, how the particles can be targeted. Uh, so starting from the right, you see that uh, uh, you just deliver, you design the particles for a long circulation and, and also with the right size, they will, because of the API, they will naturally escape uh, from the uh, bloodstream. But you can also uh, add the ligand on their surface, which will be targeting particular epitope on the tumor cell. And because of that, uh, you can further enhance, enhance the uh, accumulation. You can also target them uh, to, uh, to vascular, vascularity uh, itself, uh, to, to so-called androgenic uh, targeting. Um, so if you build the populations of particles which will follow this uh, 
design guidelines, you can now start uh, using them in different applications. As I said, uh, from a diagnostic standpoint, uh, that will be uh, imaging, and again, there are a number of contrast agents which have been developed for uh, uh, magnetic uh, resonance uh, um, and uh, ultrasound, a number of different uh, applications. One which I want to show you here is interesting from the perspective that it's building upon existing screening methodology, but uh, enhances its uh, performance because of using nanoparticles. Uh, so this uh, typical colonoscope uh, system, which essentially takes images of your column and uh, looks for polyps on the walls of the column, and then after removing the polyp, you can uh, do biopsy and see uh, if it is cancerous or not. <clears throat> so Sam Gambier at Stanford with his group came up with the idea that it may be uh, useful <coughs> to allow to determine if the polyp is cancerous or not, <clears throat> even before uh, removing it from the, from the wall of the uh, column. And that is important because it stimulates uh, uh, diagnosis and then, then of course can be supported further by, uh, by the biopsy, but also some of the polyps are actually hard to see optically. They are built into the wall, they are flat, and you can miss them using traditional colonoscopy. So he has the, the designed particles in such, a, in such a way that they are targeted to the cancerous tumor cells in the column. And then uh, they can uh, they can be uh, detected using uh, SERS. So you basically get a combination of uh, optical image and also uh, <clears throat> SERS-based uh, image uh, to and and by that means you you determine uh, uh, if, if the uh, polyp is cancerous or not. And they are in process of moving that forward. Uh, and uh, having discussions with FDA, and here you see the first uh, patient being which is called with a, a new device. <coughs> also coming from the therapy, uh, I know it's a long, uh, uh, long convoluted presentation, but we're scheduling for one hour, so now I have to uh, feel it. <laughs> Um, but uh, from the therapeutic standpoint, again, I already described the advantages of, of the delivery. And now I, I want to show you a few examples of how people approach it. And uh, first, uh, nanotechnology like uh, drug of new generation, which was approved by FDA in 2005, is Abraxin, which is actually a clever combination of albumin, which is naturally occurring protein, so you could argue if this is really a technology or not, but it's a, a, this size, size range. A uh, combination of albumin with uh, paclitaxel. And the initial <coughs> idea behind it was actually not to improve, to improve efficacy or effectiveness of the treatment, but actually to get rid of the organic solvent, Crimophore, which is used to deliver free paclitaxel. And Crimophore by itself is the source of some of uh, uh, pretty serious side effects. So by putting paclitaxel on albumin, you can eliminate Crimophore and as such reduce the side effects. And that has been approved for uh, metastatic breast cancer in 2005. Since then, it appeared that actually it has also advantages from the uh, standpoint of efficacy. And now there's a number of clinical trials for uh, different uh, uh, cancer indications, in addition to metastatic breast cancer. And this small company, which was uh, started by people from uh, UCLA, has grown and since then uh, got acquired by Celgen last year for about $3 billion. Uh, another interesting uh, offshoot of putting uh, drugs on nanoparticles is that uh, you can increase significantly uh, <coughs> uh, loading of the drug per uh, percent weight. 
Uh, and uh, with uh, paclitaxel and Crimofort is about 1%, with Abraxin is about 10%, and here's an example from Sasha Kabanov's uh, lab where he's using my cells, where he went to about 45%, and there are examples where you can take it even to 60%. So again, uh, the, you can uh, reduce the number of doses which you need to treat the patient with because of, uh, uh, of that loading. So, next example is uh, delivery of uh, another existing drug, Docetaxel. Uh, in this particular case, uh, Bob Langer and Amit Farazad at MIT Harvard use polymeric particles. FDA is familiar uh, in working with them, and they have been used in the past, so they combine PLG particles with Docetaxel. Uh, they also use targeting. Initially, it was Optimer. Currently, they are using another ligand, but from early studies, which was performed about six years ago, if you look at the tumor size after single injection, and that was actually intratumoral injection, not uh, systemic injection, you see the comparison of evolution of tumor size from control and free drug to uh, drug on the part, but without targeting and to target targeted. Uh, delivery, you see that the control of the tumor volume is getting better and better. And uh, so what they have done, they formed a company, Vine Pharmaceuticals in Boston, which took it forward uh, and uh, now is attempting to translate it to the clinic. And what you see here is what I talked uh, before about how dramatically you can change the uh, PK properties of, uh, of the drug. If you inject three docetaxel versus the one on uh, PLG particles, the resonance of the drug in the serum is significantly longer. And that uh, can be uh, taken through a number of different animals, from small animals to and rats to non-human primates and human in, uh, in this case. So again, because of that, uh, <coughs> accumulation of the drug at the tumor sites, the tumor sites should be significantly higher. Uh, and this uh, formulation is right now in uh, phase one clinical trial. Uh, we started only a few months ago, uh, but it seems that uh, they're getting uh, pretty good results. The phase one is usually only dedicated to studying uh, toxico uh, toxicology uh, or toxicity of the drug. Uh, and then <coughs> uh, the focus is evaluated later in, in next phases, but you can watch the uh, evolution of the tumor size even in phase one, uh, and they, they show some positive results uh, in, in that area as well, in addition to uh, good uh, toxicity behavior. Um, and uh, the way targeted therapies are next generation. Uh, uh, you look at uh, Braxton, for instance, uh, but uh, not targeted in any way. Uh, and uh, this is the list of uh, number of different therapies which are now uh, in clinical trials or about 20 clinical trials and uh, uh, the concept combined with one of them. Uh, another one uh, is a uh, concept which comes from Mark Davis' lab in Caltech, uh, which is using uh, cyclodextrin particles. Mark Davis also worked on uh, uh, siRNA delivery. Uh, again, as I said, this is an important application space because siRNA is uh, very fragile and uh, difficult to deliver uh, in free format, uh, but uh, in combination with particles, it seems uh, uh, to be much more robust. And all clinical trials which are uh, being pursued for systemic delivery of a area right now uh, are in nanoparticle-based format. The run from Las Vegas, uh, the other one is from Omron and the Sharps company in Boston, and uh, there's one <coughs> in Europe. Uh, and that also is the uh, so now, in addition to these more practical uh, applications, when you're actually trying to uh, develop tools which will be used in the cleaning, uh, there's also another space where people are working on uh, different, uh, uh, building different systems which will, which will allow you to learn more about uh, tumor cells and understand the disease better. And here, this is one quick example from uh, work of uh, Bartosz Dziubowski at Northwestern, uh, what he does, the movie here, which I hope I can play. Um, the 
there. He builds different <coughs> uh, channel structures uh, on the surface of flat substrates. And by changing the shape of these tracks, he can monitor uh, how cells, different types of cells, move around these tracks. Uh, so he can understand better motility of the cells. And it appears, as this next uh, slide shows here, that uh, different cells the different cells, when you design the track appropriately, move in different directions. And as you, sh as you look at the uh, bottom part of these slides, you can actually uh, sort populations of cancer cells from other cells. Uh, again, if, if the uh, track is designed appropriately. So what that means is that you can potentially eventually learn something about how uh, cells travel through metastatic process and potentially test cells that test different anti-metastatic drugs in a simulated environment like that. So as you saw, a number of people attempted to move uh, some of these techniques into clinical environment. Uh, that's not always easy and not always uh, inexpensive. It's actually more on the expensive side and you have to deal with regulatory agencies to, to move that forward. Uh, so a number of academics established the companies which are uh, trying to, to do that and I describe a few of them. Uh, but it takes a fair amount of money and persistence uh, to achieve that. Uh, on our side, in order to help with this process and uh, in order to help collecting the data on, uh, toxi on toxicity and biodistribution, we formed a lab called Nanotech Characterization Lab, and I will uh, say a few, few things about that uh, in a minute. So when we looked at how translation possible will occur, and we wrote this paper five years ago, or six years ago now, we saw that uh, a lot of these in vitro <coughs> uh, assays will move forward uh, faster because naturally uh, they are less expensive to move to the clinic, at least that will be intuitive with this thing. And at the same time, they don't, uh, they don't need to be scrutinized by regular their agencies to that level as any compound which is used in vivo. And we thought that that will be followed later uh, with therapeutics, which eventually can be combined with the uh, appropriate diagnosis doing the performance through uh, some of these nano-based in vitro assays and eventually fold them into all into in vivo environment where uh, some of the diagnosis uh, will also come from the particle and the particle will also carry the therapy. And uh, most of the work which, which I described is somewhere here, some of that is inching into this space, uh, but I think that the development of therapeutics in general uh, moved uh, forward faster or at least more people work on it than, uh, uh, than sensors, at least from the standpoint of moving to the clinical environment. And that, that was interesting to see, but on the other hand, maybe it is understand, understandable because simply working on therapy is more rewarding. You can very quickly see what the impact of the therapy is on the patient. In case of uh, diagnosis, you need to go through generational patients to see if, if cancer develops Flower in the ones who were the diagnosed earlier, uh, so maybe you, you, you need more time to, to see positive effects of solutions like that. Uh, I talked about the cost, and uh, currently uh, to develop uh, a drug in pharmaceutical industry takes about 10 years and more than a billion dollars. So obviously, there is a need for new models which will reduce this cost and also improve the heat rate. And the uh, question is if some of the non-found based drugs can, uh, can be taken through this pipeline more effectively. Another thing which happened in the last uh, uh, 10 or 20 years that uh, less and less of these technologies, at least at the early stage, are being developed within the pharmaceutical 
also is that knowing and understanding properties of these different uh, nanoparticle families allows to chart uh, <coughs> maps like that when you look at the correlation between the size of nanoparticle uh, uh, hydrophobic or hydrophilic characteristics and, uh, and surface charge and determine the spaces which are most appropriate for uh, in vivo delivery. Uh, in the panel which we will have in the afternoon, I saw that students are asking uh, for uh, prospects of nanotechnology in 2050 and 2100, which is 90 years from now. Uh, so actually, some uh, I guess we, we uh, think ahead. Uh, increase of the lifespan uh, people, and some of us possibly can survive till then. <laughs> we are not that ambitious. We try to develop uh, strategic plans for the next five or ten years. And, uh, <laughs> That's uh, the country of technology plan phase two, which we wrote about a year and a half ago, and uh, try to look at uh, where different uh, application spaces of this work can, can stand in five or ten years. So, just to close, and I think I'm in the field almost an hour, uh, what I think is important now for the field is to gradually stop thinking about nanotechnology as a platform technology. So that, that's a natural and actually powerful way of thinking about it because uh, because of the platform life structure, you can in principle use this concept in different tumor indications, but even beyond that in different diseases because some of the problems are common enough. Uh, and here, I, I listed a uh, uh, number of the spaces where, where so it's an evolving list, slightly different than the one which you saw before, uh, where uh, you know, different uh, biological applications uh, in improvement of diagnosis, improvement of therapeutic index uh, for, for the more effective delivery uh, and the ability to cross biological barriers for example, again to improve the delivery. Uh, but from that type of thinking, you can start moving to more specific tumor indications and trying to figure out what nanotechnology can do in this particular case. And I have three slides here uh, which uh, relate to glioblastoma, ovarian and pancreatic cancer. Uh, and by Looking at the more detail, you can stratify which particular uh, properties of nanoparticles can uh, be utilized here and how you can most effectively leverage them. So, what is important for uh, uh, brain tumors and glioblastoma probably in particular is that it's very hard to get a drug into it because of the blood brain barrier which protects brain. And this is a good thing, but in this particular case, it's really hard to cross it. So, so it's hard to deliver uh, therapies that are at least with systemic injection. But some of the nanoparticles uh, seem to be able to cross the great uh, barrier. Uh, you can also, and that has been cleared in Europe already, actually uh, imagine bringing particles directly to the brain and then coupling to them uh, RF or, or laser light to increase their temperature. There's a company in Germany called MacForce, which actually has done that with iron oxide particle. You can also uh, use particle for intraoperative imaging to monitor the margins. Obviously, you don't want to uh, you know, open, uh, especially in case of brain surgery, uh, patient twice, so you can make sure that the all tumorous tissue is removed during the first surgery that will be, uh, that will be certainly effective. And again, Looking at ovarian cancer, you can similarly say that uh, some of the biomarker panels which uh, have been established <coughs> for ovarian cancer, they have been cleared by FDA, but they are not actually considered specific enough. So some of the new diagnostic approaches here will be re relevant. Uh, and, uh, and that's not only particular for ovarian cancer, but also for others. Uh, developing strategy which will allow you to uh, overcome multi-drug multi uh, resistance. And for pancreatic cancer, um, this is the particularly 
difficult uh, disease to treat. Most of them are usually diagnosed late, and uh, because of them being in metastatic stage, only about 10% of the cases are uh, suitable for surgery, which essentially is only a uh, longer term uh, relevant solution. Uh, so again, of course, early diagnosis, but also now there are some of the uh, combination therapies which in involve abraxin and genistatin, which seem to be increasing uh, lifespan by factor of two, which is from six months to 12 months, but uh, so that doesn't sound like a lot, but at the same time, uh, it creates some hope. Uh, and of course, developing strategies which allow you to penetrate effectively tumor stroma, which presence in, in pancreas during, uh, during uh, tumor development. Uh, so that essentially closes the fairly comprehensive, I hope, summary. Uh, I show here a number of colleagues who worked with me. I think some of them <coughs> visited uh, Urbana Champagne in the past, and uh, many of uh, you probably interacted with them. Uh, so our role is really to point you in in the right directions in terms of funding opportunities as well as uh, uh, possible collaborations. <coughs> but also because we travel a fair amount and we see what other people do, uh, we have probably a reasonably good uh, overall picture of where the field stands and as such, we hopefully can help guide you uh, in directions which you want to pursue your work further. Well, thank you, I will stop here and we have to answer questions.
you know, cervical cancer in the past was number one killer among uh, uh, cancers in women, and now it's uh, 3,000 women a year in this country, in the developing world, that's still the problem. So, so it, it, it's hard to, in a way, look at it comprehensively. It's probably, you know, you need to do the, well into, into the details. But I think that the fundamental issue is that in general, cancer occurs at a later age. So if you move the life expectancy by 10 or 15 years, many more people will get it. So, so this statistic is a little bit far from the perspective. Yeah. Probably hard, but so that's the fundamental problem is that metastasis is still not well understood. It's clear that cancer cells are being released to the bloodstream, and that is starting to be to emerge as a tool to for diagnosis and also for monitoring of effective of the therapy. So-called circulating tumor cells get into bloodstream, and their concentration is very low, probably less than 10 for me for one milliliter. Just of white blood cells, 10 million. Uh, but the problem is now a fraction of those who are released to the bloodstream are able to lodge into other organs and actually grow metastatic tumor. And it's not clear what's, which ones and what characteristics do they need to have in order to, to be those. So, capture. So now, well, you can probably, so you can recognize two more cells in circulation, but you cannot, it's very hard to do it in vivo. So you can, you know, look at their population after you draw, you draw the blood. So, in a way, ideally what you would like to do is to develop a technique or, or, or a treatment which will actually immobilize the cells, so prevent them to be really steroid. So that, that would be probably, you know, a better strategy than trying to grab them and, and eliminate them and preventing the metastatic threat that way. Institute 
dedicated to initially sequencing four tumors, and now this list grows to, I think, 18 or 20. So now, if you understand the cancer biology behind occurrence of each tumor, you can use uh, these indications for, for the diagnosis. But I, I wouldn't expect that sequencing per se would be used for the, for the diagnosis, but the information which comes from it will be very relevant. to cancer or finding solutions to how you use the nanoparticle in cancer? actually can be treated easily because you're not treating the, if, if you recognize them early, you are not recognizing because you're not treating cancer per se, but you are treating the, the infection. So for instance, H. pyroli can be treated with uh, <clears throat> antibiotic. So, and there is a test for H. pyroli. So if you, really, if you catch it early, you know, it, tumor will never occur. With uh, HPV vaccine, now you can essentially prevent uh, human papilloma virus infection. So that's why all girls now between, I don't know, 20, uh, 14 and 26 are recommended to, to take it. So in se essentially, potentially, you can eliminate this type of cancers by developing vaccines. Unfortunately, well now, uh, oral cancers now are linked to HPV also very strongly. Uh, in the past, uh, I mean, the, the risk factors are smoking and, and alcohol use. But uh, it appears that HPV infection is also a large, uh, uh, large uh, risk factor. So again, you potentially, so now, now uh, oral cancer unfortunately occurs more in men. So but there is a push to actually vaccinate uh, boys with HPV vaccine as well. That didn't happen yet. But, so, you know, so, th so these linkages actually produce very, very good results. But unfortunately, not all cancers have been linked to viral infection and probably won't, they will never be. So now that you have this other subgroup which doesn't have this thing. So the question is how you deal with that. And again, if you establish good screening methods which will allow to uh, <coughs> capture it before, before uh, when it's still uh, confined to the primary tumor, then there's a lot of surgical treatment which actually effectively cure you, but again, unfortunately, uh, that, uh, that screening methods are not good enough to, uh, to, to be there, so there needs to be push there. Now, when you, already, when you treat patients with, with tumor which already occurred, I think that two, two big problems there, one is to understand metast metastasis better, because if you, if you did understand metastasis, and you potentially could prevent, then you are back to the square one, where I mean, in, a, in, a, in a good way, because then you are confined to primary tumor, and then you can, in parallel, in many cases, with the surgery. Another thing is to understand multi-drug resistance. In parallel, uh, try to over Another thing is to understand multi-drug resistance. Even the chemotherapy try to work over time. After after even the chemotherapy would you work. Patient develops after the extended period of time, then you have to switch to another drug. The patient develops the resistance. Or if you understood then you have to switch to another drug. Maybe with the same drug. Or if you, you understood it, and, and that maybe with the same uh, drug now could overcome it. Uh, and, and that is, is being looked at by uh, now, and it uh, seems that like combination of the liver of being looked at by a bit, and it seems that like combination of the liver of a now and some of the when you can actually <coughs> some of the mutations down some of the can can be affected some of the mutations. And the next thing is combination therapy effective approach. It appears that when you use 
the two different drugs. Drug. Combination therapy. Often, it the appears that when you use two different drugs, that the argentinum of the efficacy improvement is more than the argentinum of the symptom. Again, then, I think to large extent it's done in focus clean, too. Again, then, I think to large extent it's done in clear clean. is not and the understanding of that. I know, so there is, in a way, several fronts and we, on which you can push. I know, so there is, a, in a way, several fronts and we, on which you can push.